and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Are you bothered with bloating in the abdomen? Does your abdomen feel full? Do you have cramping abdominal pain? Do you have pain in the lower abdomen? Frequency of urination, just not feeling good? Could those be symptoms of ovarian cancer? We always think of by the time you diagnose ovarian cancer, it's too late. Things have spread, it's usually too late. That is not the case. And we'll be talking about this on the Dr. Bob Show. We'll be talking about early diagnosis of ovarian cancer. My guest is Dr. Larry Kilgore. Dr. Kilgore is a board certified gynecological oncologist. That simply means he deals with female cancers. He'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about fatigue, lots of causes of fatigue. We'll be listing eight or 10, and then we'll pick one of those and spend a little bit more time. A lot of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Larry Kilgore, board certified gynecologic oncologist, and we're going to be talking on ovarian cancer. Larry, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Hello, how are you? Tell me about ovarian cancer, the ovaries. Tell me about where they are and why they can get cancer. Well, the ovaries are an important part of a woman's reproductive system. They're down in their pelvis. They're responsible for ovulation, and uh, which results in pregnancy opportunities. And they're also important for hormone production throughout a woman's reproductive life. And that's where they uh, live and they can, of course, get cancer. Now, ovarian cancer, uh, any prevalence or statistics on that that people should know? Well, fortunately, it's not that common, although the fear that surrounds it sometimes elevates it to um, levels that probably exceed its rate. In the general population, it's only one in a hundred women will get ovary cancer. So 99% of women in our country will not get ovary yeah, cancer. But one so in a hundred, you know, that's a significant statistic to me. It is, uh, it is, and one daughter, that we should act on. My daughter or wife would be one in a hundred women. I would certainly uh, want to prevent this illness. How many diagnoses a year and how many people die? Do we have those statistics? Yeah, we do, and that's, uh, that's a problem, Bob, because uh, Although it's not that common a cancer, about 22 to 24,000 cases in the U.S. that are new each year, but about 14 to 15,000 women die of ovary cancer each year. So you do the statistics, you see that the majority of women do not survive ovary cancer once it's diagnosed. Now you have a special interest of this because of your family. Tell me about that, Larry. Well, yes, uh, I was already uh, a doctor, already a, a GYN oncologist, not too far out of my training. Uh, only child of great mom and dad, and uh, my mother had all of the right doctors uh, in her hometown, but yet she developed ovary cancer, and being under my watchful eye, so to speak, uh, yet she still got it as an advanced stage, went through the regular treatments at that time, but did not survive it. So yeah, it's a special, special disease for me to take I, care of. I'm really so sad and, you know, to hear that. Let's talk about what are symptoms that people have that are early symptoms of ovary cancer? I think that's, please thank you so much for asking that question because in years past, it was miscategorized as a silent disease that women had no symptoms, but that's not the case at all. We should educate our patients and ourselves about the symptoms and signs of ovary cancer. They're vague, Bob. They are not, you know, dramatic, often, uh, fullness in the lower abdomen, pressure, uh, sometimes frequent urination, frequent bowel movements, things of that nature that mimic other things like constipation and weight gain and getting older a little bit, those types of things. So they overlap. Is there a common age that people have these, that people get ovarian cancer? It is uh, more common the older you get and we do see it more in the sixth and seventh decade of life than we do. but in earlier ages, but you can get ovary cancer down in the teenage years as well. And we do treat a number of patients like that each year. So symptoms of bloating and abdominal discomfort, you know, that is a vague symptom. A lot of people get that. 
How do you hone in on if somebody just has vague fullness? Is it pelvic pain? Is it, you know, frequent urination? Is it so many days a month? Tell me about it. It could be any of those. Uh, usually there's a combination of things. It's not just one thing like frequent urination. It may be pressure and urination frequency or the bloating feel or your clothes are changing. So here's the important part is the symptoms don't resolve. We get constipation, we eat too much, we gain some weight over the holidays, we recognize it, we take laxatives or whatever, those go away. But when they persist, especially for two weeks or more, then you need to walk into your doctor and say, could I have ovary cancer? Many times the doctor doesn't think about it. He or she is thinking about constipation, colon issues, dietary things, and may not even do a pelvic examination, which, you know, we just need to be on heightened alert for patients who have symptoms that don't resolve. So how's the diagnosis made? You gotta have an index of suspicion, you gotta suspect it. You've got vague abdominal pain, it can be at any age, most common you said around 60, but how is the true diagnosis made? So. Um, Unfortunately for ovary cancer, we don't have a screening test, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in a few minutes. So the doctors can't rely, and the patients can't rely on being screened for ovary cancer, like we do for breast or colon or prostate. So it's diagnosed uh, by a combination of things. Uh, a good pelvic examination might feel a tumor or a mass. Uh, many times women have ultrasounds or CAT scans, images mm -hmm. of the pelvis that show a tumor or a mass. And then occasionally there will be enough symptoms that, uh, and risk that a doctor might even order a blood test called a CA125. And that's a little marker that is helpful sometimes. But it's mostly made with a woman who has a mass discovered because of these symptoms by a pelvic exam or an image like an ultrasound or CAT scan and then referred to a doctor who takes care of these things. So many patients I will operate on will go to the OR with a suspicion of ovary cancer, but no diagnosis won't be made until we actually do the surgery or obtain, obtain tissue from inside the abdomen. Then we can make the diagnosis. With a good pelvic exam, I have heard patients say they have a cyst on the ovary or an enlarged ovary. If you feel those how do you make the differential diagnosis? Suspicion? What do you do well, if they've got an enlarged ovary? Yeah, that's a great question. And in the days before imaging, uh, an enlarged ovary in a woman over 50 was reason to go to the operating room yeah. because that was cancer until proven otherwise. Of course, many of those women did not have cancer. So the pelvic, the ovary is in the business of making cysts. The reproductive age woman makes cysts every cycle. That's ovulation. Some of those cysts persist and if we have a random ultrasound or some symptoms, we may see a cyst. A cyst is just like a collection of fluid, like a little water balloon. And almost all of those are benign, even in women that are older. But if it's a complex looking cyst or it continues to enlarge or they have symptoms, then we need to raise our index of suspicion, especially when she gets to 40 and older, that this mass might indeed, indeed be a malignancy. Continues to enlarge. That means you need to have a repeat pelvic exam in two months, six weeks, three months, six months, how, how frequent? It, it, that's a good question. It's totally dependent on the circumstances. So we might uh, bring her back and uh, for something that we're not suspicious of in a low risk patient and have just a repeat ultrasound in six weeks or three months and reassure her that this was a transient thing, something that's going away that can be watched. On the other hand, if it's a higher risk patient with symptoms and an concerning looking mass or cyst, then uh, we're not gonna wait that long. We may get other imaging, we may draw the blood test, we might laparoscope the patient and look in with a little light to see if we actually can characterize it better. We're talking with Leanne Minot, good friend of mine. Leanne, thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you for having me. Uh, in April of 2013, you were gonna run a race, what happened? Well, I was in Charleston on spring break with my family, was going to run the Cooper River Bridge Run 10K, six miles, th for the fifth year in a row. But I'd been having shortness of breath for a month, maybe two months before that, and I'm a regular runner. So you'd been running for a long time? 
every day for seven and a half years. And how much would you run? Three to five miles, no, usually three to five miles. So you knew your body and you knew running and you were getting short of breath so you knew something was going on? I knew something was wrong because I couldn't even run the first hundred yards and, and I was signed up to run this 10K and I couldn't do that. So I was wondering what was wrong. So what did you do? Went to a walk-in clinic mm -hmm. um, affiliated with a hospital in Charleston and the physician uh, you know, did a physical exam followed by a chest x-ray and discovered fluid built up around my right lung. Fluid in your lung, and that was the beginning of finding out that you ended up having what disease? Well, stage four ovarian cancer. Stage four ovarian cancer, mean, meaning that it had spread. Correct. And so you ended up seeing Dr. Larry Kilgore, and um, in looking back at the symptoms that you had, was there anything that made you think of, uh, in retrospect, that you could have had this ovarian cancer for a long time? I probably had ovarian cancer for a year before it was diagnosed. Um, and ovarian presents with fluid buildup in women. Sometimes it will build up in the pelvic area, sometimes in the abdomen, uh, feeling of fullness. Did you have any of those symptoms? I did not. Mine presented the fluid built up in the, in the lung area, which, which made it stage four. Now, three or four months before this happened, before April 2013, you, ended up, you had a hysterectomy. Was that because of what problem? What I thought was just routine fibroid cysts that had grown in the uterus. So you were having some problems there and they did a hysterectomy mm -hmm. and then three months later they found fluid in the, in the lung. Correct. How hard was your treatment? Very difficult. Very, very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, you mentioned to me that you felt like, and your doctor felt, Dr. Kilgore felt, you handled the treatment very good because of what? Well, um, in, in part, God helped me get through it, in part Dr. Kilgore, but in part because I was healthy to begin with and I, and I went into the cancer diagnosis with strong heart, strong lungs, and able to tolerate very aggressive treatment. Uh, in your follow-up of treatment, uh, you mentioned that there was one thing that you need to keep on doing to keep this cancer from occurring, and that would be what? Ovarian cancer can, recurrence can be reduced by 25% with regular exercise. Have you been exercising every, regular? Almost every day. Leanne, you look great. Are you back to work? I am full-time. Full-time attorney and you, uh, mm -hmm. you're you working a eight-hour or 12-hour day? At, at hours at least, yes. You look wonderful thank and you. we thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show and telling us your story. Thank you for having me, Dr. Bob. We're talking with Dr. Larry Kilgore, board-certified gynecologic oncologist and we're talking about ovarian cancer. Let's review the early symptoms and why they're important. So the early symptoms are pressure, fullness, frequent urination, frequent bowel movements, change in abdominal size or girth, change in clothes size, and these symptoms persist. They, they don't, don't go, go away. away. Right. Who's at risk factor? Who's, who's at a, a risk for having ovarian cancer? So there's really two groups. There are those patients who are genetically predisposed because of their kinfolks or their hereditary uh, genes. And then there are patients who uh, also are at increased risk, sometimes because of their reproductive history. And that is uh, women who've had no children, um, years and years of cycles, never interrupted with pregnancy or birth control pills. And those women, uh, year after year, decade after decade, we see more ovary cancer in that group. Or maybe they only had one child. That was my mother. She only had one child. I was, she was 35 when I was born. So she had years and years of ovulations. And that's thought to be a risk factor. We don't really know why, but that is, those are the two groups. How about when you go through menopause or when you start your menstrual cycle? Does that seem to correlate at all? So years and years and years. So early, uh, early starting onset. your periods and then late ending your periods. Those more ovulations, uninterrupted and unprotected, if you will, and that increases risk. Or we mentioned earlier about a prevention type mm -hmm. uh, organization. What, what right. do you do to prevent? Yeah. So I think the genetics, I, I, I like to teach patients and physicians, nurses, healthcare providers that our patients need to know who their kinfolks were and what cancers they had. 
And we need to update this, Bob, every time we come in for our annual physical exam. We need to tell our doctor that my Aunt Sally has been diagnosed with ovary cancer since I was here last year, for example, or my sister, who's 42, now has breast cancer. So there are some cancers that we need to know about that are genetically related. Ovary is one. Breast is another. Colon is another. Uterine is one. And so these are reproductive type cancers, uterus, ovary, breast, and colon would be the other. And we need to update our doctors on our family history, especially the first degree relatives. That is your mama and your daddy, your brothers and your sisters, and your children. Those are your first degree relatives. And that puts you at the highest risk. So if somebody has breast cancer, they have an increased risk for ovarian cancer. Tell me about some of the genes with that, a right. breast cancer gene. So there is a gene called BRCA, and that stands for breast cancer, B-R-C-A, breast cancer gene. Yeah. That's an inherited uh, gene from mom or dad. If you're, one of your parents has that genetic abnormality, you stand a 50-50 chance of getting it because you get one gene from mom and one gene from dad, and depends on which one you get. So you have a 50-50 chance of that. That gene alone increases one's risk dramatically for breast cancer and for ovary cancer. And I call them skyscrapers. Those are skyscraper risks. We need to find those people. How do you know when to get that right. BRCA test? I was hoping you would ask that question. <laughs> so again, if we take a good history and include in our history the family history of cancers, then we can get some signals there for which patients to test. We actually test essentially every ovary cancer patient now for that gene because up to 20% of all of our ovary cancer patients have a genetic abnormality. And so we test all of them for that. The other red flag is the breast cancer patient who's under the age of 50, a big red flag for the breast cancer gene. Or she might have multiple family members with breast cancer. There's a whole cluster of women in the family with breast cancer. Those are sort of signals that we need to think about testing for that gene. Tell me about surgery. I know nothing about it. Okay. So the treatment of ovary cancer is the correct surgery followed by chemotherapy. And that gives patients the best opportunity for cure. And so the surgery's goal is to remove all of the cancer if possible or as much of the cancer as is technically and safely feasible. And that usually involves a fairly experienced surgeon in ovary cancer to know where to resect, what to resect. And so typically the gynecologist is not trained to resect uh, the spleen or part of the colon. And the general surgeon is not trained to understand ovary cancer. So really the, our specialty, the gynecologic oncologist who, who, who are trained to deal with ovary cancer should be trained in radical surgery to get that patient optimal at the end of the surgery. That's the surgery. And that would include removing the ovaries, removing the uterus, so a complete hysterectomy, if you will, removing any sites of disease that you find. Now, if it's spread into 22 places inside the peritoneum, uh, does it go elsewhere? Does it go to the brain, the shoulders, the bones, the liver, anywhere like that? So while we need better cure rates, it's nice that ovary cancer patients can live for an extended period of time with proper surgery and chemotherapy because it does not customarily go to the brain or the lung or the liver or the bone like some other cancers do that compromise their organs. It does compromise sometimes bowel function because it fills the peritoneal cavity, our abdomen, and it can be little tiny little freckles by the hundreds or thousands, or it could be gigantic areas of tumor. So we need to get the patient's surgery down to the small stuff. And then the chemotherapy has a much better chance of affecting a cure. It takes both. Chemotherapy pretty good for ovarian cancer? It is, it's actually actually quite good. It, we would expect 80 or 90% of patients, even with advanced disease, wow. to achieve remission. Now remission, as you know, means no detectable cancer. So far, so good, if you will. At the end of surgery and chemotherapy, they do respond well. They'll disappear and will have no disease. Unfortunately, about two thirds of those advanced patients will eventually relapse. Maybe a year, could be five or six, seven, eight years, but the majority of patients will eventually recur and they can be treated again. So when it relapses and they're treated again, can you get it to go away a second time? 
Even a third time. Even third time, even a fourth time for some patients. It's amazing, right? Must be wonderful to have the ability to do the right surgery and to have chemotherapy that really makes the person go into remission, gets rid of that disease, whether it's temporary or not. Right. And when it comes back, you can do it again. Well, just think about this. These are matriarchs. These are grandmothers. These are the center of our families, like my mother was. And to have them around for as long as possible for all those sentinel events, birthdays, graduations, weddings, grandbabies, all that business, every few months counts for a sentinel event for a woman. And for, all, for the guys, too. But my patients are all women. So I'm biased. <laughs> Larry Kilgore, you're a wonderful teacher. Thank you so much for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. It's been very educational to me and to the viewing audience. So thank you so much. for Very coming. honored to be here. Great show. If you've got vague abdominal discomfort, pain with bloating and fullness and some frequency of urination, talk to your doctor. Could I have ovarian cancer? Get the proper follow-up. And now you want to stay tuned. We're going to be talking about causes of fatigue. There are a lot of them. Do you have fatigue? What can we do about it? And I'll spend a little bit more time talking about one of the eight or nine causes. I want to thank Dr. Larry Kilgore. Excellent discussion on ovary cancer. If you've got symptoms, find them early, suggest it to your doctor. And now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Question number one, Dr. Bob, I'm always tired. I've got fatigue. I don't feel good. What are some of the causes? Well, it's an excellent question. And in the United States, lots and lots and lots of people have fatigue. Frequently, it's lifestyle. We're just too busy. We're marketed to be busy. We don't sit on the front porch in a rocking chair and say, well, I see the Smiths go by. We don't have time for that. We've got too many things on our plate and it keeps us active and we never ever stop. We never take time for ourselves. That in itself is a common cause of fatigue. Other causes of fatigue could be some endocrine disorders. Number one would be thyroid. When your thyroid is underactive, you don't have metabolism and you just get tired and your voice gets hoarse and you don't feel good and the skin gets dry and you get constipated. Very much more common in women and there's a disease called Hashimoto's disease. Luma stremphomatosa is what that is. So thyroid can cause, your doctor checks that every year. He can treat that well. There's another endocrine disease, your adrenal glands. The adrenal glands can atrophy because of different problems and if the adrenal glands aren't working you get pale your underarm gets pale uh, you don't feel good when you stand up you may faint easy uh, another cause of fatigue would be not sleeping well four major causes of sleep disorders but there are over a hundred disorders so snoring obstructive sleep apnea restless leg syndrome um, narcolepsy, all of these are major diseases of sleeping that cause problems. If you don't sleep well, you're going to be tired the next day. Obstructive sleep apnea, you're going to be tired the, and you may fall asleep driving the car. may be a major cause of getting an automobile accident. Anemia, when your blood count is low, the blood doesn't carry enough oxygen to the rest of the body and when that happens, we get tired and we get fatigued and we don't feel good. There are other causes, chronic fatigue syndrome. There are a group of people that are tired. We're not sure why that occurs, but it may be what we call substance P, P as in Paul, that comes from the brain to the nerve endings. And that substance P can cause people to have chronic fatigue and aching pain. No real blood test for that. Uh, the treatment for that really is exercise. Even though you feel so tired, you get up and make the bed and you're so tired that you just can't do anything, you've still got to start being active. You've got to walk a fourth of a block, then a half of a block, then a block. You've got to get active. You've got to do it every day. And if you begin to exercise, some of that chronic fatigue with some new medicines we have can give you a new life. So be sure that you see your doctor and talk out chronic fatigue. I want to go back a little bit to anemia. I said I'd talk a little bit more about one of those causes. Anemia is where your blood count is too low. The blood count will include a hemoglobin and a hematocrit. 
the hemoglobin is the part of the red blood cell that carries the oxygen. If it's low, if you don't have enough hemoglobin, then you're anemic and the red blood cells are not gonna have enough oxygen that nourishes the brain and the shoulder and the chest and the knees and the toes. And so that hemoglobin. Hematocrit is the other thing. If we've got a tube of blood and we let it fall, the red blood cells fall and it leaves serum up there. That percentage will tell the doctor if you've got anemia. People are pale, they get short of breath, they don't feel good. I really get short of breath with a little bit of activity and the color of their skin and under their eyes and their fingernails get real pale. If you've got anemia, your doctor can check it. There are several causes, blood loss, chronic illnesses, cancers, all of those things. If you've got anemia, you have to check it out with your doctor. That's all the time that we have for this show. Remember, we've got to do those four things. We've got to exercise. If we exercise 45 to 60 minutes, seven days a week, it'll take care of that stress. It'll help us lose weight. We'll feel better. Our blood pressure will get lower. Eight hours of sleep. If you're not getting seven and a half or eight hours of sleep, talk to your doctor about why that is. If you've got sleep disturbance, it can be corrected by sleep specialists. Eat properly. Start that day off with a good breakfast with fruit and fiber. Eat properly. Look at your plate. Don't eat so much food. Snack properly. And most of all, what is it we like? It's laughter in your life. Have you spent enough time just laughing and giggling with somebody that you love? If you haven't, well, laugh some more and you'll find that when you giggle, you'll be healthier.